What's up, guys? It is your boy, SimoneFan101, and today we are on another edition of Star Wars Mania. Today, we'll be looking at the beginning of what at one point was the most infamous Star Wars movie of all time, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Now, of course, this movie came out 16 years after Return of the Jedi, which came out in 1983. This film came out in May of 1999. The first six Star Wars movies all came out in May, so I'm not even gonna uh, go into, you know, like, different dates and stuff. Um, this movie, while it made a lot of money, and a little extra money when it was released some odd years ago in 3D in theaters, um, this movie had to basically exist on the back of what is quite possibly one of the greatest... I can't even say quite possibly, what is one of the greatest um, movie trilogies of all time, and what is has become a complete conglomerate, you know, since the release of The Return of the Jedi. Video games, um, you know, cartoons, uh, and several other little bits and toys have all been released since Return of the Jedi. Now, because of that, George Lucas has completely taken over the reins of Star Wars, he's no longer he no longer has to um, condense his story, in and you know get rid of certain things, uh, in order to appease the mass public as a just in case. This time he's completely taken over the reins. George Lucas has become a mainstream name, and um, and he can, and has become synonymous with genius when it comes to sci-fi, sp fantasy adventure films. Now in creating with this movie. It bore the most flack. I mean, seriously, has there ever been up to this point in 1999 a more um, bigger buildup for a film? By 1999, the answer is no. You, there's very few ones you could actually come up with. You'd have to come up with a few names later down the line in the 21st century, even just a few in the past few years that could even come close that would come close to that, including. Episode 7, The Force Awakens, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, as far as the behind the scenes goes, George Lucas has completely taken over the reins, similar to what he did in New Hope, as he as instead of giving other people certain jobs, George Lucas has completely taken over the director's share, he's taken over the screenwriting share, and he's the story the story man. He's basically the three heads behind all this movie similar to how he was in A New Hope, but he did have to listen to other people back then. Now he doesn't have to listen to other people. He's his own man, so to speak. So he can do whatever he wants. And the only thing he really didn't do, and to be fair, he never did this in any any of the movies, was get a producer, a main producer behind the guy named Rick McCallum, who would actually go on um, to produce episodes two and three as well. So... Clearly, you know, they got someone who was long-lasting in the franchise. How does this movie work out? Well, let's go over the plot. And I will get to certain details a little later. Um, you know, small details, you know, a special effects and everything, similar to what I've done the last few reviews. But this time, it, it, it's going to be more concentrated, considering the kind, of, um, the kind of mood this movie brings to a lot of Star Wars fans, good or, or bad. So, okay, what's the story? Well, it's we're 35 plus years before the events of the original trilogy, and things were, are a lot more political this time around. The Trade Federation um, has been blocking the planet Naboo, um, preparing for a full-scale invasion of the planet. Um, the Trade Federation is led by Viceroy Newt Gunray, who... He's in several ways the main bad guy of this movie, but it's cl it's very clear early on that he's under the thumb of an even darker, sinister uh, character, um, Na uh, Darth Sidious, who of course would later on to go to be the Emperor in the original trilogy. Why does he want to take over uh, Naboo? It's never really explained why he wants to take it over, but he just wants to take it over. This is Star Wars, so... There are certain things in Star Wars we can let slide um, because, well, it's Star Wars. It's honestly one of the few things that, you know, 
can actually be overlooked because people want to take over shit all the time. It's the kind of universe that Star Wars has become. Um, the Galactic Republic, which the name was name dropped um, once or twice in during the pretty much in the beginning of uh, Episode Four, A New Hope, um, is still active at this time. Supreme Chancellor Valorum sent two Jedi in order to settle this dispute between the Trade Federation and the planet Naboo. Um, Qui-Gon Jinn, played by Liam Neeson, and a young Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Ewan McGregor, um, who I believe was a very young man at this time and was a huge fan of Star Wars, which is part of the reason why he wanted the role of Obi-Wan. And I'll, I'll get to the acting in a bit. Um, Darth Sidious, uh, of course, wants the planet taken and, pre and pretty much orders the Viceroy to kill the Jedi after he it's known to him that, yeah, the Jedi are now involved in this situation, and so is the, um, the Republic uh, by extension. Uh, they escape the main um, droid command center, and they go to the planet Naboo to warn the people. Coming across Jar Jar Binks along the way, who is a, a Gungan outcast who's been banished because, let's, let's face it, he's kind of a little shit in this movie. I mean, seriously, Jar Jar Binks is one of the most infamous characters in all of Star Wars. Probably still is the most infamous, but a certain character in Episode Eight does have him on the ropes. Um, Jar Jar Binks does do, actually do a couple useful things, though, by leading them to the underwater Gungan city, um, where they meet the rest of the Gungan people, and despite Jar Jar nearly getting killed, is allowed to lead the Jedi... Um, through, through basically um, the, the sea of the planet to Theed. Theed, of course, being the capital city of Naboo and the place in which the um, Queen Amidala resides. By the way, uh, queens in this universe work a little differently. Uh, they're not, like, they don't pass down through bloodline. Instead, uh, they're elected queens and apparently have terms. So basically, she's the president of, of Naboo, not so much the queen. Why do they call it the queen? Well, it's Star Wars. Who really gives a shit if, it, if, if you know, it's an elected queen or not? That's honestly one of those small details that really doesn't matter in the long run because Star Wars is a really freaky universe. <laughs> um, so they are able to rescue... Uh, they were able to rescue um, Queen Amidala um, from the droids and the Trade Federation. And along with a couple other characters, do escape from Naboo in order to go to Coruscant, which is the basically the capital of the, Gal of the Galactic Republic. But of course, during their escape, even from some help from our dear old friend R2-D2, um... Their ship is damaged, and they have to go to Tatooine in order to find parts for the hyperdrive, as the hyperdrive is damaged, and they can't um, they can't really go anywhere. Um, while on Tatooine, they come across Ani a young Anakin Skywalker, played by Jake Lloyd, and oh, sorry about that. Well, yeah, he's played by Jake Lloyd, and because of his situation, which is that he is a young nine-year-old slave to a guy named Watto, uh, let's just say he is very, um, let's just say we say sheltered. Um, I, of course, make that, you know, little quip because Jake Lloyd's performance was infamous, almost as infamous, infamous as Anakin Skywalker, as um, well, Jar Jar Binks and Hayden Christensen would later be, but that's for another story. Um, Watto, who of course owns Anakin, is the only, um, the only, uh, shop owner, the only person, uh, in Mos Eisley who actually owns the parts that they can actually, that, um, that they could use, the good guys. Um, uh, problem is, you know, not gonna give it up easily because the money, they don't have, like, Tatooine money. Um, they all go by credits and, you know, that doesn't work out. Um, uh, also fair, uh, point. Anakin Skywalker was the one who built a uh, C-3PO, and I gotta say, you know, 3PO does actually look pretty good with all his nakedness showing. You can see, like, the inner workings. I actually like that. Um, so, with some betting and legal wrangling, um, Anakin be, uh, wins in a pod race to not only get the parts that Qui-Gon and the others need in order to leave Tatooine and go to Coruscant, but inadvertently um, 
is relieved of his slavery as a bet through Qui-Gon um, allowed him, allowed Anakin winning to be freed from slavery. Why was he freed? Well, it's because thanks to a little something I'll get to later, um, Anakin is revealed to be possibly the chosen one of the Jedi. And, you know, and Qui-Gon is basically hell-bent on wanting to train this kid and bring him into the Jedi Order. Um, although, sadly, Anakin's mother has to be left behind because she does not, uh, she, her slavery, um, was not, you know, under the same kind of rule. She was not allowed free. On their way to the ship on Tatooine, they're encountered by Darth Maul, who is Darth Sidious's apprentice. Um, I'll get to Darth Maul in a bit. Um, but of course, this is the first. I, this is the first clue, real big clue, to the Jedi. That yeah, the Sith are not dead, as they would think. They um, later on, as they, it would be said later on. Uh, instead, the Sith are very much alive. Um, they're able to escape, though. They go to Coruscant so she can plead her case to the Senate on what's going on in Naboo, and at the same time, Qui Gon and Obi Wan um, go to the Jedi Council to tell them both about the Sith Lord and particularly from Qui-Gon, to tell him about Anakin, and, you know, hopefully hopefully that he will um, become a Jedi. Things don't exactly work out for both sides. Um, because, you know, pe because Chancellor Valorum doesn't have true control of the Senate, as there are um, several different things going on, and with the help of, of Senator Palpatine, um, uh, Queen Amidala... Uh, goes to um, to a vote of no confidence for Chancellor of Lorem. Now, and due to this, later on, it's revealed that Senator Palpatine would be uh, named Chancellor Palpatine, but this wouldn't happen until the end of the movie. Of course, there's not enough time. While with it on the Jedi side, the Jedi refuse to uh, refuse to train Anakin because, well, not only is he older for a young boy, he's already developed an emotional connection, and his tra and the future, his future is clouded. Oh, sorry about that. His future is clouded, so they, fe they fear to train him or else, you know, you know, they might have to deal with what he might become. Um, cor um, frustrated with the whole corruption of the Senate and taking time, um, Queen Amidala... <coughs> I don't have my water bottle with me. <coughs> Queen Amidala goes back to Naboo to try to take the planet. Um, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon go with her, as well as Anakin, R2-D2, Captain Panaka, who's like the captain of the guard, and is actually underrated in this movie in terms of uh, his acting. And uh, several, and even Jar Jar Binks, they go to try to retake, reclaim the planet. Thanks to a, a grand army that the Gungans have, and several guards that were freed over um, that were freed from um, the Trade Federation, they mount uh, a, a, uh, an assault on the on the palace. The Gungans go to fight the Trade Federation in a in a remote area. Um, Queen Amidala, who has revealed herself to be Padme Amidala, I forgot to mention this earlier. Padme um, was supposedly a handmaiden. Uh, for the queen, and developed a, a, a an emotional bond with Anakin, <coughs> even though she had her doubts on whether or not Anakin could free them. Um, she does care about she does care about him, as we would most definitely see in the next two movies. Uh, there's a stupid bug here, um, and sh and because of her um, revelation that she is indeed Padme, and. She, he no longer has her decoys with her, um, or his de her decoys, I should say, have been exposed. It gains trust of the Gungans, who are always fearful of the humans of, of Naboo, and they form um, a, a partnership here. Because of this, they go their plan um, goes as pretty much as well it starts. And of course, to try to um, keep away the main some of the main armies of the Trade Federation, a certain group of ships. Um, go to attack the um, the main battle station um, up above the up above the planet. So you have four fights going on at the same time. 
I mentioned three. Why do I say four? Because Darth Maul is still on Naboo and goes to fight Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan into what is quite possibly one of the best scenes in probably the best scene in the movie and one of the best scenes of all the prequels and definitely in my opinion one of the best scenes at all of Star Wars because of just how epic the fight was as well as the music um with this in mind um things go awry uh Qui-Gon dies in his battle against Darth Maul but Obi-Wan uh does prevail in defeating the Dark Sith Lord um Anakin through some mis some sort of mistake and you know, dumb luck destroys the battle station up above the planet when he act, when he goes into one of the ships and is basically forced to fight. Uh, be because of this, the Gungans get saved from almost being killed by the main droid army, and Viceroy Gunray and his cohort are captured by Queen Amidala and Captain Panaka in the throne room of the palace. <coughs> After all this and everything that's happened. Obi Wan eventually takes control and uh, takes control of the situation and is allowed to train Anakin in the ways of the Force. At, at while Yoda and Mace Windu, played by Samuel L. Jackson in this movie, um, debate on whether or not this was the only Sith Lord or is there another? Is there a master and is this one only the apprentice? Um, the ending of the movie, of course, shows. Um, a parade going on showing the peace and unity between the different members of the Naboo people. And, and of course, Q and, and credits and John Williams' music. So, what, so yeah, I've, I had to go through a lot of the plot because there is a lot of plot in this movie. I'm, I'm looking at the time right now, I'm almost 17 minutes in, that's because there is a lot to get through in this movie. There's a lot of plot and a lot going on, and... Yes, this is not a perfect movie. I'm going to say that right now. This is not a perfect movie, but I still enjoy it. It's not great. It's not even anything, like, really good. It's, uh, it's you know, in the, it's in the somewhat good area. Made mistakes, but looking back, it's not nearly as harmful as, you know, some people might think. I know there are some people, like, say, you know, for example, James Rolfe and Doug Walker, who who can't give this movie a really fair shake because they grew up in the original trilogy, and that's fine. That's fine. Now, granted, I did grow up with this movie, which means I am softer on it, but even though I'm softer on it, I'm still going to call things out on bullshit. Um, like I said, there is a lot of plot in this movie, and it's kind of, and it, it, you can say, and it can be a little bit weird to try to go from, you know, moment to moment to moment, while and you and while you can keep up, there's not there's there's not a whole lot of time to really digest yourself like you can in the original trilogy, even episode six, which was the most flawed of the three. Um, with that said, the story itself is actually really good. So even though you can't truly digest yourself in the story, you can at least enjoy the story for what it is, and you know, trying to be something original. And you know, just trying to um, trying to expand the landscape of Star Wars to just simply swinging swords and shooting lasers. Um, what are some? Okay, so with that said, what are some things I dislike about this movie? Let's get the dislikes out of the way first. Um, the act, some of the acting. The acting ranges from bad to good. I'll get to the bad first. So some of the worst acting, of course, would come from the characters you expect to have bad acting by this point. Jake Lloyd is Anakin Skywalker. Um, I'm forgetting his. I'm forgetting his name here. I got his name on my notes here. Um, Ahmed Best as Jar Jar Binks, and during mainly her queen persona, um, Natalie Portman, who was a teenager at the time, as Padme Amidala. Um, you expect these to be bad because they are, um, because they are infamous. Especially the first two are infamous for the kind of acting they get. Um, so, yeah, you do have, uh, certain things wrong here with the acting. Jake Lloyd is over the top as Anakin, though at least he does give personality. And to be fair, I saw behind the scenes of episode one and certain kids going for the role. Some of those kids were monotone. 
Jake Lloyd honestly was one of the better choices because he showed some personality and emotion. Some of these kids were monotone in the lines that they were saying. Granted, the lines they were saying weren't good, and I'll get to that in just a quick second. Um, Ahmed Best, of course, is infamous for how bad Jar Jar Binks is, and I'm not, I'm not even going to blame Best for that because that is entirely on the hands of George Lucas. You know, Ahmed Best tried, but Jar Jar Binks was just a completely shitty, shitty character. Now, to be to give this movie a slight break with that, annoying characters are not new to this. People, when people look at Jar Jar Binks, they're like, "Oh my God, he's the first really annoying Star." No, he's not. Jar Jar Binks is not the first annoying character in Star Wars. The Ewoks were the first major annoying character in Star Wars. And as much as I love him in the original trilogy, even C-3PO had a couple moments here and there of a, of a little bit of whininess. Um, but, of course, that was part of 3 pos charm. You could say that. But mainly the Ewoks were the first real characters that were pretty annoying and made you want to stab yourself. Jar Jar Binks makes you want to stab your balls off. That's how bad he is. So yeah, he's worse than the Ewoks, but to say that he's the first, you know, annoying bad character is not true unless you just really like Ewoks, in which case, you know, more power to you. Um, as far as the, uh, and like I said, um, Natalie Portman, when, she, when she's in her queen persona, and I'll, and I'll explain it a little bit, when she's in her queen persona, she's monotone as shit. I mean, she talks like this, I have, I have a vote of no confidence, and Chance of Valorum's leadership. She's very monotone. She's not showing too much emotion. Now, granted, she's a queen and a and a and a, and a figure, so there are moments where you're not where you're not going to be able to show that. But still, you have to show some kind of emotion. You, I think, the scene you get that best in is when she's talking to Senator Palpatine because Palpatine knows who she is. Well, well, yeah, she knows. Well, she knows. She has a close partnership with Palpatine, is what I really should be saying. So, that's the scene where, where the Queen persona gets the gets the, the most emotion, but still, she's very monotone throughout most of the movie. And it's a little, it's really ridiculous uh, how monotone she can be. And it's like, woman, take this situation seriously. My God, be a little bit better. Um, and I'm mainly talking about the main actors when I say the acting. Um, I'm not going to get to some of the other ones. Um, the special effects also range from bad to good. Um, mainly the CG effects are the negatives. Some of the CG still holds up. I think the droids, eh, a little bit flimsy, but the droids, I think, still hold up okay. Basically, anything robotic um, holds up, it still holds up pretty well. And... By, and the best scene in this movie that has really good CG is the pod race scene um, in the middle of the film on Tatooine. That is, is a long extended sequence, but it's a great sequence. And the and the effects for um, the pod race still really hold up. And even the effects for the um, the space battle, and even some of the effects, um, mainly with, in terms of the of the weaponry for the Gungan battle against the droid army, um, they still kind of hold up okay. The, the CG that really doesn't, has not aged that well, um, were basically the alien characters. The Gungans, Jar Jar Binks, Sebulba, um, Watto, all of these CG, you know, characters that are alien, um, all of them do not hold up by today's standards. They're not Godzilla 98 bad, but you can, you can definitely tell they've aged. And not in the best way. Um, even with even with some possible talent behind it, they just they just haven't aged. What are some other things I don't like? Um, there there are some things I don't like. Again, the fact that there's so much plot into about uh, an what a two hour film, um, a, you know, two hour plus, a, you know, two hour five ten minutes film. Um, the fact even with so much plot, it feels like the plot of these. Uh, there's just so much plot here to unravel that sometimes it's hard to get through um, through certain points. Um, I believe this uh, this movie was given about maybe 15 or 20 more minutes. Uh, we could have uh, some you know some scenes where people can digest um, what is going on and digest the emotion of it. Um, if of course you feel the emotion for it, um, 
cert, uh, certain things um, in this movie, there are certain things in this movie, of course, that don't work. Um, uh, for example, in the beginning of the movie, um, it's briefly shown that Jedi can actually use um, speed force, like, not like the Flash, but like, like force speed, I should say. Force speed, which was a, a, a creation that originally came from the, um, the, the expanded universe at the time and the video games. And this is the only time in any of the movies where they did it. And they never did it in the rest of the film, which is like, man, during that final battle, maybe Obi-Wan should have done the Force Speed and actually saved Qui-Gon. It's the only time in the movie that they do it, and it doesn't really, it still doesn't hold up. It's a, it's a nice little, little visual, but it doesn't make sense when in the rest of the movie they never do it, even though it would have been really friggin' useful. Um... And one other little thing, and while I won't give it, I, I'll actually put this somewhat in the positive and negative, the political talk. I think there's a couple of details left out in terms of the, politi the political nature of this film. I'll get to why this is partially a positive um, in a bit. Um, so, okay, I went over the negatives. What are the positives of this movie? Because there are positives. Um... Like I said, the acting from some of the characters um, are still pretty good. Liam Neeson is Qui Gon Jinn, the very the the no nonsense type of um, type of Jedi Master. Liam Neeson does really well, similar to how he would later be as Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins, but actually a good character and a little bit less ruthless. But you you can kind of still see the vibes there. Then again, he's also played by Liam Neeson, so you know. You can see a little bit of similarities. Uh, Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor was a, a, a fantastic choice, as it would turn out, as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, we don't see too much of Kenobi in this movie. This is more of an ensemble cast. If I had to choose a main character, it would be Qui-Gon, and he's dead by the end of it. Um, but Ewan McGregor um, plays Obi-Wan Kenobi, and, Obi and he really captures the es essence of Alec Guinness's uh, role as Obi-Wan Kenobi. In fact... And Guinness himself, um, not Guinness, um, Ewan McGregor himself worked so hard perfecting his Obi-Wan Kenobi voice from the original trilogy, which is part of why, a bunch of part of why he got the role. He wanted to make it a, belie a younger, believable version of Obi-Wan, and not just a guy badly playing a role that we all know and love from the original trilogy. Um, I mentioned Natalie Portman. Earlier, I said the Queen persona was really monotone and pretty much crap. When she's actually in her Padme persona, she's not great, but she is tolerable. She has she shows a little bit more emotion. She's shown to be more of a regular person, and she is shown to develop a, con a connection with Anakin Skywalker that would play itself out through the rest of the prequel trilogy. Um, so at least when it comes to her. Um, her, her Padme persona, she at the very least, um, you know, kind of nails it. Now, I'm not going to put all the blame on Natalie Portman for the monotoneness of, of the Queen, because there is another character who steps in. Uh, Kira Knightley plays, um, uh, plays a version of the Queen. Why? Because in order to do the decoys, you have to have a look-alike. And, to the credit of this movie, because I, you would think it, they actually CG, um, a look-alike. Like, like kind of like CG, like the character's face with Penelope Parman's face. No, they got an actress, they did her makeup that was similar looking to Natalie Portman. They got Kiera Knightley, and she captured the voice of the Queen so well. So, I'll give the movie credit in the fact that they actually were clever enough to get an actress that... Um, could sound and look very similar to Natalie Portman, and under the white makeup, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. You have to you have to look really close if you want to tell any existential differences. So, to the credit of the movie, I'll give it that. Um, there are um, now, granted, there's still still some you know over the top acting from like Watto and Sebulba which does get in the way of kind of, of the movie. Um, to rectify it, though, to rectify Newt Gunray, because Newt Gunray also can be a little bit over the top. I don't understand what people say when they call him a racial stereotype. I never... Is he supposed to be black? 
I never got that. If you could explain to me in the com if any of you guys can explain in the comment section below, tell me why um, the uh, why Newt Gunray and his people are some are racial ster are racial stereotypes. If you can tell me, I'll be happy to hear you out. I've just never been able to figure it out on my own. Um, even though he's in some ways is over the top, um, someone who isn't over the top, no matter what role he's in, I'll get to that in episode three, is Ian McDermott's character as Senator Palpatine. This is a guy who really knows his shit. He's a guy who um, who knows what he's doing um, and is just absolutely great at his role. He's great at talking. He's great at speaking. Whenever he's on screen, he constantly chews up, chews up the scenery. And is constantly, you know, is really the best actor in this movie. He's been, he's probably the best actor in all of the movies. And up until episode three, he's not, he's not always in a lot of it, which is the smart thing about it. But I'll get to that by episode three. <coughs> of course, we have returning actors like Anthony Daniels and Kevin Bacon. <coughs> Did I really just say Kevin Bacon? Kenny Baker. Uh, apparently, I got footloose on my mind. Uh, we got returning actors Anthony Daniels and Kenny Baker as C-3PO and R2, and I'll give it this. I'll give it this. 3PO looks pretty damn cool with all of his inner parts showing. And I believe it's actually practical. And with the exception of the few moments that they need, R2-D2, for the most part, is still an actual moving drone that they remote control throughout the movie. Um, now... Speaking of, and I say CG, speaking of the effects, speaking of the effects, when, like I said earlier, whenever the movie is CG, it really doesn't hold up in terms of the animals and, you know, certain scenes that you can tell are obviously CG. Um, in terms of uh, practical effects, when this movie does practical effects, it's fucking great at it. The costumes are really good and are very on par um, with not even on par, are better than the uh, prequel trilogy. And I mentioned this, um, I kind of mentioned this in episode four, but this is the first Star Wars movie that, while the others had a decent budget, this was really the first movie that could really show off the different worlds. It could really show off big scenery, um, scenery moments uh, that the previous films couldn't do because of their big budget. Even episode five, which had, you know, the biggest amount of um, scenery, uh, still had to keep to a certain location. Um, and you had to, you know, had to do certain tricks here and there. Um, you didn't have to do that in episode one. You could show off the kind of world that you wanted to show. You could show a giant city that was a planet. You could show the swamp and, uh, and everything. You could show the underwater city and all of its beautiful glory, which I really enjoyed about pretty much all of the prequels, especially this one in episode three. Um... Speaking of the acting, I forgot to mention two actors earlier. Um, uh, his name is Hugh Quarshy. He's the guy who plays Captain Panaka. Rewatching this movie again, I was I was shocked how much I actually liked Captain Panaka. You, he's the guy who you he's like the straight man. You could totally buy pretty much anything he says because you get the feeling he actually gives a shit. Another character I have to talk about um, is Ray Park as Darth Maul. Darth Maul, of course, has become somewhat of an icon in Star Wars, and you would say, oh, he doesn't talk much, he has really no character development, but that's to the advantage of the characters, the fact that he is such a mystery, and that you don't know about him, is the, and that's what I loved about his character, is that he doesn't have a lot of screen time, but when he does have screen time, he fucking takes control of the situation, and he always makes it at least either somewhat memorable or somewhat menacing, of course, the movie's called The Phantom Menace, he should be a little menacing, um... You know, we have other actors like Samuel L. Jackson and Terrence Stamp as Mace Windu and Chancellor of Lorem, respectively. Um, and you, you, you have some bad things. You still, there's some of the jokes. Everything having to do with Jar Jar doesn't work. Um, the thing, what makes Jar Jar so, also so hated is the fact that he's in so much of the movie, which really, you know, bogs the movie down several paces. Um, so, yeah. This movie has a, so, and yeah, the jokes, the poop jokes, him stepping on shit, uh, I don't like that. Um, the, how the Gungans are portrayed, um, like saying, you saw him big doo-doo this time, I'm like, come on, man, come on. So, yes, 
there are plenty of problems with this movie. But I think there's more good than bad here. I can't sit here and say, this movie is complete shit, everything with the writing is bad. Yes, the writing for Jake Lloyd is not good. Saying, are you an angel? Yes, some of those lines are pretty crap. But there are some good lines in this movie um, that are said by several characters. So I can't sit here and say it, it's garbage, because I don't think it is. Um, I think it, there's more good than bad here. Just that the bad is so famously bad, it tends to overshadow what's actually good about the movie. So, uh, with that said, what rating would I give it? I've been kind of back and forth what I want to give it. I'm going to give this movie a 6 out of 10. Like I said, I think there's more good than bad here. Um, some of the acting from some of the characters are pretty good, um, as I've said. Um, you know, other characters like um, Shmi Skywalker, played by um, Pernilla August. Uh, she did a good, a decent job for what it was worth. Um, you know, you could tell there was at least some effort, and they were trying to tell a different story. Um, you know, there was some real effort going into this movie. And while there are some famously bad things, I don't think it's big enough to outweigh the good. So for that, for that said, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. There's still some good action. There's still some good acting. The good, the practical effects are really good. The, um, the like I said, the battle scenes are very well done. Um, and while there is too much plot and too much politicizing, keep in mind, guys. And you watch the beginning of episode four. There are elements where there are talking politics. So I can't even blame the movie for that. The fact that they do talk a little bit of politics because that was an element expanded from episode four. So. I can't blame this movie on that, because I'd have to blame episode 4 for that. And it's not done bad there, and I don't think it's done that bad here. With that said, um, give this movie a 6 out of 10. Join me next week when I review what, may, what some people, myself included, consider to be probably the worst of the live-action Star Wars movies. Until next time, guys, peace and good night, and happy Super Bowl Sunday.